I'll turn to Isaiah chapter 11. I was going to go a different direction for this morning. Um, and as I was kind of looking over some things in Scripture, uh, God, I prayed about it. God led me to this. Uh, I have notes that I've saved. Apparently, I did uh, a sermon series on the seven spirits of God uh, back about nine years ago, 2015. Who remembers that series? I don't either. So, but um, just so you know, I'm not, I'm not completely using my old notes. Uh, I've taken it in some cases in a different direction. And this morning, um, when we, we're going to start with the first of the seven spirits of God, uh, which is the Spirit of the Lord. And um, I've got one direction I'm going to go with this morning on that subject. But then there's another direction that I think is relevant as well. That's one thing I like about the Bible. Um, this, this past week, uh, I didn't really work on some brand new uh, presentations for that church. They, most people never heard of me. And so I just uh, pulled some things that I had already uh, had worked on and had put in PowerPoints. And, um, and so I taught it down there. And um, usually, if I, if I teach on the same subject one place and then I do the same thing in another place, uh, almost without fail, I do them completely different. And that's what I like about God's Word, is that you never, ever, ever run out of things to preach on. And uh, I remember years ago, I've mentioned this before, but I just preaching on Sunday morning just made me a nervous wreck. And it was trying to think of things to say, things that would, you know, like anybody could get up and read a verse, but then to expound on that for 40, 45 minutes, 50 minutes or whatever. Uh, some of the churches, 20 minutes. I don't get that. But anyway, um, to expound on that, it, it was difficult. And then when God began to really just open up his word uh, to my heart, and to my mind, um, and to study the way I do, um, when you just lay one scripture down and then another one and then another one, it is not difficult at all to preach or to teach God's word. And uh, so that's something that Jesus told us, but he intended it for, for all of us to, to know. He said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I can, I can truthfully say that years ago, uh, the way I preached, I was taking my own burden, and my own burden is heavy. But I cast my cares upon the Lord, for He careth for me. And then I take His yoke upon me, and I found out that it's light, and it's easy. And uh, it's something that, uh, something that has really helped me in my growth in the Lord, and hopefully it's helped many of you as well. Isaiah chapter 11, uh, I hope you're there, say amen, because I don't have that verse to put up on the screen. But we'll start at verse 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Think of what did Moses carry around with him uh, when he did all the miracles in Egypt, and then when they crossed the Red Sea, what was he carrying? He was carrying a rod, and that rod was Christ. It always is Christ. It shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, meaning that Christ's lineage is going to be traced all the way back. And you can do this in Matthew chapter 1. You can do this in Luke chapter 3. You can trace the lineage both times all the way back to David from Jesse. And then go back all the way in Matthew 1. You can go back all the way to Abraham. In Luke chapter 3, you go all the way back to Adam, who the Bible says was the son of God. I like that. And a branch. Now notice we have a capital B here. That signifies to us, the translators knew that that was concerning Christ. The, and, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And when I see that, I think of John chapter 15, uh, where Jesus said, I'm the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me uh, shall uh, bring forth much fruit. And then um, Romans chapter 11, where Paul teaches about the olive tree being Christ. 
And the natural branches that were there were taken out and God took us as wild olive trees, wild olive branches, and grafted us in to Christ. And my question to you this morning is, have you been, have you been plugged into Christ, the olive tree? Have you been taken from the wild life that you live and, and taken off and put into, what is that, grafted? You've been grafted in to Christ contrary to your nature. Think about that for a while. Our flesh has this wild, wicked nature and it wants to be fulfilled all the time. But being grafted into Christ, now we have the Spirit of Christ in us. We have that uh, Spirit of His Son crying, Abba, Father. And we say to our flesh, you're not doing that anymore. You're not going to these places anymore. You're not going to watch that anymore. You're not going to look at that anymore. You're not going to listen to this anymore. And I tell you, the more you grow in the Christ, the more things of this world will bother you. Amen. So a branch shall grow out of his roots. And then verse 2. We have the seven spirits of God right here. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's number one. Spirit of the Lord. And I want you to notice that Lord is capitalized. All the letters L-O-R-D is capitalized. Now, when we get to that, that's not going to be for today, but when we get to that, we'll understand why it is, we'll understand what it is, why it is, and how important it is. Okay? And I've got a lot of ammunition on that one. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, that's number one. The Spirit of wisdom, that's number two. And understanding, that's number three. The Spirit of counsel, that's number four, and might, that's number five. The spirit of knowledge, that's six. And then of the fear of the Lord. Now, I, I would ask this ahead of time. I know this is going to be about seven or eight sermons away. But I just want to ask you this morning, do you have a reverent fear of the Lord? I know the Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And that fear then is applied to this world and, and applied to our enemy, the devil. And he's telling us God has not made us afraid of the devil and what the devil can do to us. He's given us a, a spirit of, of a sound mind and of power to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But I want to ask you this morning, do you have a proper reverent fear of what God will do to you if you step out of line with him? Do you, do you regard God as your father and God as your father, just as any father would their child, take their child when they get out of line, take their child when they've been talking in church all the time. Mama, I love you. Amen. And say, I'm going to whip you for that. I'm going to get you for that. And uh, if that's the case, then I, I believe that you have a proper fear of the Lord. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, bless your word this morning. I pray, dear God, that you'd open up our eyes, our heart, our ears to the word of God. Teach us great and mighty things which we know not. Prepare us, Lord, for days to come. Give us understanding of days that are past. And Father, we just pray, God, that you would be in our midst today. Help me to preach your word today. I'm taking it in, your, in my hands. I believe it to be every word that proceedeth out of your mouth, Heavenly Father. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would speak to all of us from the pulpit on down. We pray this in Jesus' name, and amen. When he says here, uh, the first of the spirits is uh, the Spirit of the Lord. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But in Revelation chapter 1, if you notice what I have underlined here, we have actually a picture of the Godhead. Mentioned in Revelation 1, in, in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. John is writing this as a letter, and he's going to write this part of it, and then he's going to write the seven letters to the seven churches. He said, Grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come. So there he's talking of the Lord God, the Father. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And right here he's speaking of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you look down at the bottom there. 
The, the phrase Holy Spirit is found exactly seven times in your King James Bible. Isn't that something? You say, well, I thought it was in there more times because I see it in the... No, what you're seeing is the phrase Holy Ghost. And I was asked that as a question this past week. Uh, somebody asked me that they said that they've noticed that in the modern Bibles, uh, they've replaced the phrase Holy Ghost with Holy Spirit. And, and I knew sort of the thinking behind that because I've read what some people said. And they get all indignant. And they say, our, our spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is not a ghost that goes around scaring people. And then I just laugh at, at their ignorance. The word ghost that we have comes from German. And a lot of our language comes from German. It comes from French. comes from Saxon. It comes from uh, uh, Latin. comes from Greek. comes from some of the, the Scandinavian languages. I mean, we speak a mingled language, but the word ghost literally means spirit. Amen. So he's the Holy Ghost. By the way, that phrase is mentioned 90 times in the King James Bible. Because nine is the fruit of the... Isn't that something? How old was Sarah? Yeah. Amen. Anyway, the seven spirits which are before his throne, that's the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ. So we have God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. And I want to say to you today, aren't you glad that Jesus is faithful to you even when you're not faithful to Jesus? And the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Revelation 3.1. He's mentioned the seven spirits again. Unto the angel of the church in Sardis. Right. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. Well, if you go back, if you still open to Isaiah chapter 11 and read that again, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So Christ uh, exhibited in his life and his everything that he did that he had the seven spirits of God dwelling in him. If you remember on the day that he was baptized by John the Baptist, what was it that came down from heaven and rested on him? The, the, dove, the spirit in the form of a dove. So he hath, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. We know the seven stars are the seven churches. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. I'm going to be honest with you. I would hate for God to look upon this church and say to us, that's a dead church. Now, some people might come here because we don't dance around and kick our feet up in the air and lay all over the floor and laugh and all that crazy stuff that people do in churches. They might, they, they might look at us and say, well, that's a dead church. You can hear it in their music. All they do is play old hymns. Amen! You know, I used this as an illustration one time. If, uh, let's say that you had two chickens in a box and all you could see is from the neck down and one chicken just standing there and the other chicken in the box kicking around and turning around and flipping all that stuff. You might look at the one standing still and say, well, that's, that chicken's dead. It's not doing anything. But this chicken, that's alive. You can see that they're doing something. But what happens when you cut the head off a chicken? I say the church that's alive is the church that's still standing. When everybody else falls, amen? So amen, I would hate for God to call our church dead. I don't think he does. I think God knows that this church, that we're going to be honest in the sight of God, that we're going to worship Him in spirit and in truth. When you come into this place, bring all your sins with you. 
and lay them at the foot of the cross. Let the blood of Jesus Christ cover them completely. Amen? Revelation chapter 4. Immediately I was in the Spirit. I, loved, I did get a chance to show that church down in Lebanon. Uh, this particular passage, how it represents the human body. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now I want you to think about that lamp of fire burning. Light will do one of several things. Number, or excuse me, fire will. Fire will bring light. And so practically any light that we have, even including these here, uh, you, basically you're burning something and heating it up for that light to shine. And so fire brings light. And when you have God's Spirit dwelling inside of you, you do have light. You see things in your life for how they really are, not how your best friends tell you or people that like you tell you. You, you have the honesty of God in you. You're, you are aware of your sins. You're aware of your sin nature. You're aware that uh, you're, not, you're not really the best person that's ever walked in shoe leather. You might be one of the worst, but God loves you. You have that light shining in you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, the Bible says, and a light unto my path. And so those seven lamps of fire burning before the throne are that. They represent the seven spirits of God. In Revelation chapter 5, this is a picture of Christ. Because Revelation chapter 5, there is, we see God sitting on his throne. And he has in his right hand a book sealed with seven seals. And uh, that issue, that thing of seals, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But anyway, in Revelation 5, they're looking for someone who could unseal that book and have it read. And they search far and wide. There isn't anybody in heaven that can do it. There isn't anybody uh, down on the earth that can do it. And then they beheld, and Jesus was there. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and one of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. We know that is Christ. He is the Lamb of God, uh, slain from the foundation of the world. Stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Now, I know that sounds a little bit weird. But notice what these seven horns and seven eyes represent, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. What does a, a, a sheep or a goat or a ram use their horns for? Fighting, but fighting over what? Territory. The, the goat who butts head the best is the one who's going to be in charge of the territory. And what it means, what horns represent in the Bible, is strength and dominion. And I am glad that my Savior, as a lamb, has seven horns on him. Amen? Those horns are the seven spirits of God. And I'll tell you something. In any situation in life where the devil has encroached into your life, or he has encroached into your family or your children. Or let's say the devil has encroached maybe in this church in the form of uh, maybe somebody that's not right with God or whatever. And they're causing trouble. That the dominion does not belong to them. The dominion of this church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his church. Amen. So when I, I was thinking about that one time. Thinking about those seven horns. And I was just wondering about it. And then it occurred to me. That Samson is a type of Christ with his seven horns. Samson, as you know, was a Nazarite from the womb, from his birth. He had never drank wine. He had never eaten any grapes or raisins or anything like that. He had never touched a dead person. And there was never a razor that touched his head. I, I, you can imagine. He's got one of them ZZ Top beards. Amen. Amen. And hair, I mean, just, so what he did was, 
he worked those, that hair that he had in his head into seven locks. Those seven locks are a foreshadow of the seven spirits of God that are in Christ and was in him. The seven spirits of God characterized by the seven horns that Christ had on his head. That's what those seven locks represented. And you see the verse there on the screen, Judges 16. She made him sleep upon her knees. Talking about Samson. And who was it that made him sleep? Delilah. She called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him and his strength went from him. I'm here to tell you that if you don't have God's spirit dwelling in you mightily, you will not be able to say no to the devil. You will not be able to say no to your flesh. You will have no power whatsoever against your enemies. You know what your biggest enemy is? You. That person you look in the mirror at every day. That's my enemy right there. And you'll, and you'll have no power against them. And I want to tell you something. A majority, I'm just guessing here, but I'd say that a majority of the sermons or so-called sermons that are presented in the 21st century modern churches are nothing more than psychoanalysis, psychological tips on how you can defeat sin, how you can do this, about how you can do that. You can have victory over uh, all the things that are against you. And it's all about you, 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 you. I won't go to a church like that. I'm going to go to a church that's all about him, 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 him. Amen? If it ain't Christ, I want nothing to do with it. And if it doesn't have his seven spirits uh, available and manifested and present. I mean, what does the Bible say? Not by might, not by power. I probably have that in my notes. But by my what? Spirit, saith the Lord. Samson wasn't just strong in his flesh. He had the representation of the seven spirits of God dwelling in his life. That was made evident by that story. Psalm 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words. As this, this is talking about the seven spirits, I believe. The, uh, the, words of, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You might want to write this down. It was in 1604 that King James of England uh, authorized a brand new translation of the scriptures. It was completed exactly seven years later in 1611. Seven times passed over the translating of this book that we hold dear right here. I think God purified his word. Amen. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Revelation 5, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. I'm going to show you that those seven seals represent the Holy Spirit in your life. Number one, I'm just going to ask you, do you read your Bible? Do you read your Bible? Do you meditate on your Bible? Do you think on these things? Does the Word of God abide and live inside of your heart Keeping you from sin. Does the word of God have that power in your life? Or are you like so many? Um, I don't, I don't want to cast any negative light on the church that I went to this last week. There was many people there that I could tell they love the Bible and they love the word of the Lord. But there's always people, no matter where I go, you can tell are Bible deficient. I'll ask simple things like, uh, how, how many days did the, did, the, uh, did the rains fall upon the earth? And people won't know that. Um, you know, just simple things out of the Bible that you would think somebody that's been in Sunday school, somebody that sat under some good preaching, simple things that they ought to know. But there is always a group of people, no matter what church I go to, 
that is Bible deficient. And they don't know anything about the Bible. It's something that John and I were talking about, John Uter and I were talking about. He's, he's pastored several churches. And he'll pastor a church and it'll occur to him fairly quickly that although those people come to church, they come one, two, maybe three times a week. Some of them are there every service. They amen the message. They uh, may respond every now and then by going to the altar. But the truth of it is, he, he's able to show them things in the Bible and them say, well, I didn't ever know that was in there. One of the greatest things that you can do in this ministry to help me is know your Bible. Know your Bible. That way, if I preach something and it's out of line, you know it. Or if I preach something and it's right dead on target, you know it and you say, Amen, Pastor Mike. That's exactly what I just read the other day. God bless you. Hey, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The words of the Lord are pure words. Purified seven times, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. This book has got God's seal of approval on it. And let me tell you this, the only person, we've read this verse already, the only person who can unseal what's in this book is Jesus Christ. I can't. I can't. So when you read the Bible, be sure to invite Jesus to come with you to show you things that you never thought would be in the Bible. They're probably there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 talks about the sealing of those of us who are saints. And I'm going to ask you another question this morning. Are you sealed by God? What does sealing do? Um, those of you who used to sell Tupperware... What was the main selling point of selling Tupperware? You put the lid on it and burp it, right? Remember that? I'm tell huh? That's right. It keeps the bad stuff out and the good stuff in. It preserves it. I'm going to ask you this, a qu another question this morning. Do you know and believe in your heart that God has sealed you Unto the very end. Amen. 2 Corinthians 1, 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth us with you. That word establish means that God has stuck you in the ground. You are standing and you're not going to fall away. So has God established you or established you in the faith of Jesus Christ? Are you positive that you're born again? Are you sure that you're saved? Do you have the sealing of God's spirit on your life protecting you, sheltering you, keeping the bad stuff out, the good stuff in, preserving it and so on? Do you know that about your relationship with God? He which establishes us with you is in Christ and hath anointed us as God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. What that, and a lot of you probably already know what that is. When you say, I'm going to buy something from somebody and I don't want anybody else to get it, so I'm going to pull out a couple hundred dollar bills, give it to the guy and say, that's my earnest money. That means I'm going to come back with my checkbook and I'm going to buy this thing from you. Don't you dare sell it out from underneath me. So that man who you gave that money to knows now because he doesn't, the, the person that gave him the money, he doesn't want to lose $200. He knows that you're going to come back with a checkbook and you're going to, he's going to write the check. You're going to sell him whatever it is he's looking for because you have given him your earnest. And God has done that with us. Do you know down deep in your heart that God has given you the earnest of the spirit in you 
and you know beyond a doubt in your mind that you are born again, that you're saved, and when your life draws to an end, you're going to heaven. I hate to bring this up, but Brother Sterling knew. He knew he was going to heaven. He wasn't afraid. He didn't guess. He didn't say, oh, I hope I make it. You know, that's how some people are. They think that if their good deeds end at the same time they die, then they'll, they, they might have a chance of making it to heaven. I don't know where they get to. I think they get that from the Catholic Church or some kind of nonsense like that. But I'm telling you that each and every day that you live, you know that God has sealed you. You know that if you die today, you're going to heaven. There's nothing in your heart that can be greater than having the earnest of God's spirit in your life and that you know you're going to heaven because God gave you the promise that he would and it abides in your heart. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, in whom also ye, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Notice, I'm going to draw your attention to something. I think I'm doing more teaching than I am preaching, but anyway. Where he says here, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. There are some people who limit, when you say the word gospel, they limit the gospel to a little section of the Bible like John 3.16. That's the gospel. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. They say that's the gospel. Well, what about, what about what Paul talked about in Romans? Is that the gospel? Yeah. What about what Paul said to the Galatians? Is that the gospel also? What about what Peter wrote about? Is that the gospel? Yes. What about Isaiah? Does Isaiah teach about the gospel? Isaiah 53. Everything that happened to Christ on the cross right there in Isaiah 53. What about the Psalms? I can think of Psalm 32 right now. Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose transgression is covered, whose sin is hidden. There's the gospel right there. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's the gospel. What I'm telling you is, is that from Genesis to Revelation, this entire book is the good tidings of great joy which shall come to all people. Hey, somebody say amen. You can't, and here's what I'm getting out of that. You can't just believe a little part of the Bible to be true and not believe the whole rest of it. With God, it's either all or nothing. You're either going to believe the whole Bible, or you might as well just not believe in any of it at all. That means the universe was created in six days. That means that the flood reached over the top highest mountain, 15 cubits, and you believe that. You believe that the flood covered the entire earth, not just a little section of the, of the Middle East somewhere. You believe those things. You believe that there were giants and that David brought one down with just a stone in a sling. You start believing those things, I tell you what, God will start helping you. Amen? That's the Holy Spirit at work. Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, he said, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Here he says it again. He said, In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Ephesians 4.30 Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. I mean, start looking at this. All three of these verses tell us that we're sealed by God, and all three of them tell us that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. So that book that is in God's right hand, sealed with seven seals, that's this book, the Word of God. You want the seven spirits of God in you, you want the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. You want those things manifested in your life? They're right here. Read your Bible. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, back to Isaiah. Again, these are the seven spirits. I've already covered that. Zechariah 4, 6. I, I mentioned that verse. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, 
Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. If you want to, turn to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, and underline that verse. That way, when you meet Zechariah in heaven, you can say, Boy, I tell you what, that was great what you wrote in there. At least you'll know one thing out of the book of Zechariah, all right? Amen. Now, several times, I can't remember how many times, the number didn't really jump out at me. But several times, the Bible mentions specifically the Spirit of the Lord. And so this morning, you might ask, well, what, what good does it do to have the Spirit of the Lord in me? How does that work in my everyday life? Will that help me when it comes to my walk with Christ? Will that help me when it comes to issues that arise in a, in a marital relationship? Will that help me understand what is wrong in the eyes of God and what is right in the eyes of God? Will, will having the Spirit of the Lord in me, dwelling in me, protect me from my enemies? Will it stay with me until the very end? Will I know it? Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention, uh, this time I'm going to mention my brother-in-law, Steve. Steve just, I mean, he just blessed my heart. And this was several years ago. But I could tell God had worked to work in his life and that God was all in him. I could still see him to this day sitting there, that second pew there right where Monica's sitting next to his mom and dad, sitting there with his King James Bible in his hand saying, Amen, Amen, Amen. I'm going, that ain't Steve. That's some new man that's there. That ain't him. And him coming to me one Sunday morning early here at the church, come in my office and said, Mike, or he said, Hoggard? That's what he called me, hoggard, or hog dog, or any other variation of hog. That's what he called me. He said, how will I know I'm going to heaven? And I told him, I said, you're eat up with it. I said, I see a difference in you I've never seen before. We went through some scriptures, and we prayed there in my office once again. And God would give him knowledge and understanding. And sure enough, that Friday, he went to heaven. I have no doubt about it whatsoever. None. God had put it in him to know that his sins were forgiven. And I'll tell you, there was a lot of sins there to forgive. And God forgave every single one of them. And made him such a new creature that he was unrecognizable to anybody who knew him in his past life. We had a man who came to his funeral service from down in Bon Terre, and he said he got around some of the cops down there in Bon Terre, and they said, I guess you heard Steve Leonard died. Yeah, we heard that. Well, I wonder where he is now. Ha <laughs> ha. And they all made a joke about it. And I had told the story that I had just told you this morning. And that guy came to me and he said, I'm going to go back and find those cops down there. And I'm going to tell them the truth of where he really is. Amen. When you got the spirit of the Lord in you, you'll know it. And it'll stay with you no matter what. I've often mentioned this. Before I die, I believe and I've asked God to do this. That that day will not come upon me as a thief. I just quoted 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That day shall not overtake us as a thief. Steve knew. Sterling knew. Um, Lee Walsh knew. I'll never forget that, Sister Betty. And many of the other people that I've had the, the joy to preach their funeral and tell you all of these people they knew they knew and before you die from this world if you are sealed by God I promise you you're gonna know it somehow some way you may not be able to convey it to everybody people may not understand it but you know it In judges chapter 14 verse 5 this is one thing the Spirit of the Lord then sent then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath. And he came to the vineyards of Timnath. 
And behold, a young lion roared against him. What does that sound like to you? A roaring lion? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. There will always be a roaring lion against you. It'll be, uh, guys, it'll be against you as the heads of your families. You say, why us? Because God sets up areas of authority. And he always, and I'm just telling you what the Bible says, he always places men at the head, the head of the family, the head of the marriage, the heads of the church are men. The people who wrote the Bible, they were men. The 12 apostles, they were men. It isn't that God hates women. No, 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 not by a million miles does God hate women. But God sets up and establishes areas of authority. And I'm telling you, the roaring lion will go after the boss first. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. I've encountered that on more than one occasion in my life. Smiting me in hopes that my family will fall completely apart after I'm gone. And I'm telling you that if it hadn't been for the Spirit of the Lord in me, because I mean one day I was, man, I was down. I was depressed. I was, I, I, it just felt like the devil was just pulling me away, saying, Mike, you need to get away from here. You need to leave. You need to go away. Get alone somewhere. You leave your family. Leave the church. Leave everything. And when the Holy Ghost quoted that verse to me, smite the shepherd, I did. I stood up. Literally, I stood up and I said, "Ah, uh -uh, devil, you're not getting them. Mm. The lion roared against him. The lion roar against your family, your marriage, your church. Our nation is full of lions. Y'all believe that? There are people in this country that would love to see the end of Christianity in America. And you know what? It won't be done by politics. All the devil's got to do is fill this country with enough lust gratification. And those who are faking Christianity will fall for it every time. But what the devil doesn't want is some people in this country that have the Spirit of the Lord in them. Because look at what Samson did. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he rent him as he would have rent a kid. That means ripped, not leased him out. Amen. He took that lion, grabbed him, and ripped him to pieces. With, and like it was nothing for him to do that. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, you can stand against your enemies. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, the lion will roar and you'll just laugh and roar back. And then if he attacks, you can take him mightily, tear him apart, get rid of him so that he never ever comes back on you, your, fa your family, your marriage, your, your walk with Christ, your church. Never again will it happen. Judges 14. Here's another instance. With Samson, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil. I don't think Jackie Chan's killed 30 men at once. Amen. How would you like for it? Do you be so strong? 30 men could gang pile you and you just knock every one of them out. And it's nothing to you. Listen, how many men, women in this country, I mentioned this a while ago, that are against you because you're born again? Politicians? Actors, actresses, the whole, seems like the whole music industry, full of satanic garbage. Movies, all of that stuff, against 
Christianity. They love making Christianity or Christians look like backward people who don't know anything. And we're all a bunch of inbreds. And we believe in this God that doesn't really exist. They despise us for that. But I'm telling you, when you get the Spirit of the Lord in you, one thing that will happen is you will not be ashamed to tell people, I'm a Christian. I'm born again. There's, there's nothing you can do to me, nothing you can say to me, nothing you can threaten me with that will cause me to change my mind because it wasn't me that changed my mind to begin with. It was God. Judges 15, 14, And he came unto Lehi. The Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Look how it's saying that. The Spirit of the Lord, let me go back here. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that, see this is when he was basically making stuff up to tell Delilah. Anyway, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire and his bands loosed from off his hands. Here's what I'm going to ask you this morning. What are you in bondage to? What are you personally in bondage to? And I tell you, the devil has got a whole big bag of tricks whereby he loves to put people in bondage. Some of you, you the devil tried to put you in bondage when you were just a little kid, small child. The devil opened up temptations to you or something happened to you at a young age and the devil was behind that because he figures that once you're in bondage you'll never come out of it you'll never be able to come out of it or and this is what happens with some people some people get in bondage and they've been in bondage so long that they really do believe that there's nothing better that they will ever attain to. I mentioned this, this man earlier named Derek, not D Derek, but the man I went to high school with living out in this homeless camp, college graduate, veteran I imagine that there's probably some post-traumatic stress going on in his life maybe maybe drugs and alcohol I don't know but he's in bondage and I just hate seeing people in bondage I would like somehow some way to help him. Somehow, some way. I don't know how God's going to work it out. I don't know what I'm going to do. But if he's in bondage, I would love for him to find that Christ can make him free. That's what I'd like for it to happen. People in bondage could be sitting right here in this, in this room. Maybe you're in bondage to stuff on the internet. Maybe you're in bondage to alcohol or drugs, uh, street drugs and prescription drugs. Maybe you're in bondage to pride. That's a bad one. That's a bad one. Maybe you're in bondage to your past. Or you're in bondage to what people think about you or what you want people to think about you. 
And hopefully you haven't given up. Hopefully you haven't said to yourself, maybe there are some things that God cannot do. That's the worst place in the world to be. Because with the Spirit of the Lord upon you, those bonds will break, and you'll find out they'll break easily. You, no, you don't have the strength for it. When Samson had his seven locks cut off, he definitely had no strength in his body whatsoever. And we always picture Samson as like this Arnold Schwarzenegger guy, just big, big muscles and things like that. But I don't know, he may have been some little skinny, scrawny, looking guy that people going, man, look what he can do. But he broke himself from bondage. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and those bonds were easily broken. God can do it. God can do it. Will you let him? 1 Samuel 10, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt... Oh, look at this. Look at this. Um, I'm going to stop here. Two men are addressed in these two verses right here. Saul and David. When God sent Samuel out to anoint the very first king of Israel, God led Samuel to this man who stood head and shoulders above everybody else. His name was Saul. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And when Samuel poured that oil over his head to anoint him as the king, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, meaning the prophets, and shalt be turned into another man. Look at your Bible. Isn't that, isn't that great? When God comes upon someone, no matter who they are, and what they've done, and how they've been used to living in a certain way, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you will be turned into a different person, and people will see the difference. You won't have to uh, go around telling everybody, I'm saved, I'm born again, oh, look at me. People will see it in you. Just like me, seeing, seeing my brother-in-law sitting there and saying, Amen to my preaching. The guy who a couple times wanted to tear my head off. He was mad at me a few times, I can tell you that. But I saw in him, he was a different man. Uh, you remember Brady and Bradley Crumb. The, the, the day that their dad found out he had inoperable, uncurable cancer, I was in his hospital room. I told those boys, you guys go on, I'm going to witness to your daddy. The whole room emptied out. I witnessed to Keith Crumb. He got saved right there in his hospital bed. And I'm not kidding you. Five minutes after we prayed that prayer, the doctor came in and said, you've got cancer. It's all over. It's, we can't treat it. You're probably going to die from it. He told his two boys. His boys have been reading the Bible since they were kids. He told his two boys. He said, boys, I just feel like I got somebody living inside of me. He knew more about theology Amen. He knew it. God turned him into another man. And that other man's in heaven right now. I'm going to see him one of these days. But look, though. It ain't how you start. It's how you finish. Saul committed the sin of rejecting the word of God. That's a sin. Saul was told in no uncertain terms to do a certain thing, and he didn't do it. He, then he lied about it. Oh, I did do it. And that's when Samuel said, okay, then why do I hear sheep in the background? Saul was supposed to kill everything and everybody, including the king, and he didn't do it. And so 1 Samuel 16, then Samuel took the horn of oil... And anointed him, meaning David, in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. 
Notice that. But, verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And how did Saul regard David? Threw a, threw a spear at him, tried to kill him. Saul went on a hunt to hunt down David to kill him because he had evil spirits in him compelling him to do that. And listen, I have seen it in all the years that I've been in this church. I could give you name after name after name of people that I sat under as a Sunday school student, sat and watched them serve the church, people that would go out on visitation, people that were board members, people that were Sunday school teachers, people that were music leaders. I can tell you that not everybody that I grew up under stayed right with God. In many cases, they just went right back out to the sins that they wanted to walk away from. One man in particular, we always, every, every preacher that was here always went over to see this man to try to lead him to the Lord. He was a, um, he was a high school science teacher and so to him, the idea of God wasn't scientific, and so he never would believe in it. Years later, him and his wife, they moved down in the Bonterre area. And there's a pastor down there that I know. And his wife started going to her, his church. And finally, the pastor went out and talked to this man. Well, that man decided, you know what, that makes sense. I think I'll give my life to the Lord. And for a year, he was always in church. Until the pastor decided to do a series of teachings on Sunday night on the book of Genesis and the creation. And the first message that he brought forth, this high school science teacher, I mean, he blew a gasket. He verbally attacked that pastor after the service and said, You ignorant man, how, how, how can you believe such nonsense that God created everything in six days when we know it took billions of years? And he said, I just can't believe that you would teach something like that and believe something like that. And he walked out, never went back. Peter says, addresses that very thing. If you turn to um, 1 Peter, I believe. 1 um, Oh, let's see here, Lord, help me find it. Maybe it's 2 Peter. Yeah, turn to 2 Peter. Verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I've seen that happen to people in my lifetime. And if it hadn't been for the grace of God, I'm pretty sure I would have been that person too. But when the Spirit comes upon you, and he wants to seal you forever. Let him do it. And you'll get to a place in your life to where you'll finally say, you know what? I don't care if the sky falls. 
I don't care if everybody else around me turns away from God. I'm staying with Him. That's the Spirit of the Lord in your life. Um, I want to lead us in prayer. By the way, I now realize why so many people are having their aches and pains. Take a look out the window out there. Amen. Thank God for the rain. Amen. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Let's bow our heads. And I'm just, I'm just going to lead in prayer. If you want to come down here and pray, you're more than welcome to. I don't want to deny you that. But I'm just going to ask you a simple question this morning. Is the Spirit of the Lord present in your life? Is He present in your life? Do you know that you have God's Spirit dwelling inside of you? You know it beyond any doubt. The Spirit of the Lord will give you power and strength that you never had before. Not against people. Against spirits. Against sin. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, first of all, we thank you for the rain coming down on us, Lord. Water the trees, water the grass, water the gardens, what's left of them. And we thank you, Lord, for sending showers of blessings down upon us today. We ask you, Heavenly Father, Lord, that, that your doctrine would distill as the rain and as the dew on the earth. And refresh our souls this morning. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this message. I wasn't sure, Lord, that this was from you, but I see now that it is. Father, it wasn't anything that I said. It was what you said. That speaks to hearts, deals with hearts. People, upon hearing your word willing to yield themselves over to you. And I pray, dear God, that you would lift up those who have a heavy heart. God, that you would take their burdens away from them, nail them to the cross, and that they would accept your yoke because your yoke is easy. And Father, I just pray, dear God, for my brothers and my sisters, here and around the world. The people that love you. The people that want to serve you. But their flesh often gets in the way. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would give them the anointing of God. Seal them, Lord, with your Holy Spirit of promise. And let the Spirit of the Lord come mightily upon them. Whenever the situation warrants, Father, they're, they're in a battle. They're in a battle for their own soul. They're in a battle for their families, their marriage. The devil always has a steady supply of flesh gratification. And Father, that's the thing that we need to stay away from the most. And Father, I pray, dear God, that the Spirit of the Lord would come mightily upon these people. And Lord, they would be diligent now to serve you. To fight against the devil. To fight against the wiles of the devil. To fight against their flesh. Give them the strength to stand when all others fall away. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you, God, for working in us your goodness. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.